Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to introduce our guest speaker uh, today because uh, we go back a long way and uh, tell you a little bit about history. This is Dr. Elijah Saunders. And uh, Dr. Saunders and I go back uh, over 30 years. Uh, and he actually hired me at the University of Maryland 30 years ago. Um, and they didn't know what to do with me as the young chief of emergency medicine. It was a young field at the time. And uh, the Department of Surgery wanted me to report to the chair of the surgery. Department of Medicine reported to the Department of Medicine. Pediatrics wanted me to report to the Department of Pediatrics. And Dr. Sonny says, oh yeah, he'll report to me. So he broke the tie. And uh, because of Dr. Saunders, I had a wonderful career at the, at the University of Maryland. A little bit about Dr. Saunders. Uh, well, he, he entered uh, medical school in 1956 at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. And at that time, the University of Maryland School of Medicine was, a, was accepting uh, black students. But the institution across town, uh, Dr. Saunders could not apply to, and that very famous institution was Johns Hopkins University. So Johns Hopkins University in 1956 was not accepting black students in their uh, medical school. It wasn't until uh, a number of years later, Dr. Saunders, that they actually did accept the medical students to apply. At the time at the University of Maryland, uh, where uh, Dr. Saunders trained, they had a white entrance and a black entrance during those first several years. So he's got a lot of history uh, at, at the university. After uh, graduating from medical school, he did his internship and residency at, at the University of Maryland. Uh, he went on to his cardiology fellowship. And then actually had a 19-year career in private practice. So uh, it was a very interesting time. And he was recruited back to the University of Maryland in the Division of Cardiology and one of the vice presidents for the uh, University of Maryland Medical Systems Hospital. And that's where I got to know Dr. Saunders. He's had a very storied career. Uh, he's had over 100 publications, uh, too numerous to name grants. Uh, he lived through the golden age of hypertension uh, in, in the uh, mid-1980s when uh, uh, hypertension was beginning to be recognized as a, as a specialty. Uh, the American Society of uh, Hypertension and the International Society of Hypertension and Dr. Saunders was a, uh, actually one of the founders of, of both of those societies. He's been on CBS News. He's been on almost every news station, uh, uh, every television station. Uh, He's had so many articles written about him. But, but one of the reasons why uh, we brought him here today is that Dr. Saunders started the barbershop program uh, for blood pressure in, uh, in Baltimore. Both uh, the barbers taking blood pressures as well as the churches. And he started that as a public health initiative and it's been an incredibly successful program. And I know in Prince George's uh, County there's well over 100 churches now that are part of the program that you started as well as the barbershops. And as uh, Dr. Saunders uh, affectionately says, the, uh, the barbershop, and I'll quote you, I think is a black man social club. And that's where a lot of the education goes on as far as healthcare. And uh, I think some of you know, we brought uh, a, a program similar to that uh, to uh, LSU and to the community. Uh, Joshua, our second year resident, is helping to lead that program. We had a wonderful, uh, two-hour session this morning with uh, eight of the pastors, uh, about six of the barbers uh, in, in uh, um, the inner community. In fact, we started the program in a way Dr. Saunders didn't even realize we're actually started with the barber shop that trains the barbers. And so it's, it's really an exciting program and, and Dr. Saunders is helping us to improve that and to expand it. So, uh, without further ado, he's going to talk to us today about hypertension, control the community, air, heart, the health program. It's a real honor for him uh, to be with us. And uh, I know he's already said that he's been very welcome in Louisiana. It's a very friendly place. And we're really honored that you're here uh, today to talk with us. Thank you, Dr. Summers. It's on. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I, I know him better as Bob than as Dr. Barish. Uh, you're very fortunate to have him here, uh, uh, to have the chancellor to be as involved in a... To have a chancellor to be involved in a program 
of this type uh, says a lot for uh, LSU and for and for the, in, the, the significance of the program to this uh, uh, academic uh, community. Uh, I'd like to give also credit to uh, Dr. Jordan. He's been wonderful, uh, uh, not only as a resident, but in terms of communicating with me and seeing to it that we could uh, bring to you what I'm going to present to you in the next uh, several minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, as you can see that uh, cardiovascular health uh, is important to everybody, whether you're black, white, male, female, uh, young or old, uh, cardiovascular health is important because uh, when you get out of here, it's going to be because your heart stopped. So uh, it, it's kind of important to everybody. Now uh, cardiovascular disease, of course, is uh, we don't know all of the mechanisms involved in causing cardiovascular disease, but we know that there are risk factors. And it's been the control of the risk factors, thanks to the American Heart Association and other groups, that we've been able to reduce uh, the incidence and the prevalence. So heart disease, for a, to a great extent, even though it's the number one cause of death, is preventable uh, to a great extent uh, by control of these risk factors. Now, we can't control the uh, genetics, uh, whatever you uh, inherit and get here with, you're going to have that. Uh, but obesity and uh, hypertension, dyslipidemia, uh, diabetes, uh, sedentary lifestyles, uh, these various risk factors ca uh, can be controlled. And, uh, and therefore, we uh, have been able to prevent and to a great extent reduce the incidence and prevalence of cardiovascular disease. Now, to be sure that you understand what I'm talking about, I'm talking about all of the diseases that affect the cardiovascular system. So it extends from the brain down to the toe. Uh, so it includes the, uh, the heart, the great vessels, uh, the kidneys, and the blood vessels of the brain uh, as well, uh, which is why stroke has become a part of the American Heart Association uh, concern. The American Heart Association for many years was known only as the American Heart Association, but now it's known as the American Heart and Stroke Association because of the intimate involvement of stroke. And what causes stroke? For the most part, high blood pressure uh, causes stroke for the most part. Now, uh, the uh, risk factors uh, for coronary disease besides Hypertension obviously includes cigarette smoking, uh, uh, hypertension, blood pressure over 140, over 90, uh, diabetes, uh, uh, fasting blood sugars elevated, uh, family history of premature cardiovascular dis uh, disease, uh, and uh, 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 age, uh, uh, getting coronary disease prematurely in a, a woman before age 55 or man before age 45. Uh, these are the risk factors for uh, coronary uh, uh, disease. Uh, other risk factors are dyslipidemia, uh, low uh, HDL, uh, high uh, LDL. Uh, just being a male uh, gives you increased risk. Uh, obesity, overweight, uh, and physical uh, inactivity. Now, uh, how pervasive is this problem around uh, the world? Well, it's the number one cause of death in the world as a whole, uh, uh, becoming the number one problem in developing countries as well. But in developed countries, it is the number one uh, problem that we have to deal with. An average of one death uh, every 33 seconds occur from cardiovascular uh, disease. Uh, High blood pressure is by far the most common contributor to cardiovascular disease. 25 to 30 percent of the, uh, uh, of the world's population have high blood pressure. Uh, over uh, 80 million people in this country 
and there's a 90% chance that you'll get high blood pressure before you die, uh, whether you're black or white. Uh, the complications of high blood pressure uh, are, are well known, as I told you, stroke being one of the most significant ones because stroke is so disabling. If you ask patients, would you rather have a heart attack or a stroke, uh, they say without thinking, a heart attack. Uh, stroke is so disabling. And yet, stroke is largely preventable by controlling uh, high blood pressure. Uh, people that are sedentary have a greater risk of cardiovascular uh, the, uh, disease. And uh, for the most part, we have become a very sedentary uh, society. OK, so uh, we decided, uh, therefore, to look at what were the major risk factors that were contributing to cardiovascular disease. And we came up with the fact that obesity which is the fastest growing epidemic in this country. Uh, um, more than 60%, 61% of adults are overweight or obese. Uh, uh, adolescents uh, are becoming more and more obese. You just look around and you'll see uh, that kids, that uh, little stubby, uh, pot bellies uh, at a very, very uh, young age. Uh, so obesity is by far the most important contributor because obesity then leads to hypertension, leads to diabetes, leads to dyslipidemia, and all of the problems that eventually lead to cardiovascular disease. So if there's anything that we need to get hold of, and I don't have to tell you in the South, it's the obesity uh, uh, problem. Okay, so uh, what are we going to do about it? Uh, uh, we have done a fairly good job with smoking in terms of reducing uh, smoking to a great extent. Still too many people smoke. The obesity problem, we're, we're not getting hold of that uh, very well. And it's my personal belief that unless we approach the obesity problem, like we approach the smoking problem. That is almost through legislation, through uh, making uh, high calorie uh, foods unavailable. I know this gets into people's personal habits. Uh, Mayor Blumberg in New York uh, suggested that the, uh, the drinks be reduced in size. He's been criticized for that. But I actually kind of agree with him that uh, unless we approach the obesity problem, in the same way that we approach the tobacco problem, I'm not sure we're going to get a, a, a handle on it. So uh, what can we do and what should we be do, uh, doing uh, in order to uh, 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 solve the obesity problem? Well, it should begin with the children. It's a shame that physical education has been virtually eliminated from many schools uh, system. The time that kids spend watching television, on the internet, uh, and uh, doing things that are very sedentary. Uh, when we were kids, of course, and many of you when were kids, uh, you got home from school, you were outdoor playing, moving around. But now they go to the internet, to the television, and they sit there for hours. Uh, work sites uh, have begun to make uh, uh, physical activity much more accessible. And I'm very happy to say that uh, most uh, uh, major work sites now have gyms and places uh, on site where you can go during your lunch hour or before your, your work day or after your work day uh, to exercise. Uh, healthier food choices, uh, we think, uh, uh, needs to be almost legislated uh, where that uh, kids do not have access to the foods that are, are not uh, uh, healthy. Uh, less excessive portion size. Uh, again, uh, back to, to Mayor Bloomberg. Uh, 
uh, he suggested that uh, rather than having those large uh, uh, quantities of food available, uh, not only at fast food but other places, have smaller portions available, uh, reduce the, the, the size. Now, you say, well, people should make that choice themselves. Well, they aren't doing it. So since they aren't doing it, uh, we need to do it uh, for them. So I, I think that uh, 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 having some legislation like smoking uh, will uh, help to get a hold of the obesity problem. Uh, exercise, physical exercise. Uh, I, we find that unless the exercise is fun, people are not likely to do it. Uh, so uh, we, we think that uh, to uh, tell people to go to the gym or uh, to go down to their basement to use their treadmill, how many treadmills have been bought and are in homes now that are never used? They're in the basement, and all of you know what I'm, t what I'm talking about. Uh, so unless the exercise can become fun, uh, so golfing and playing tennis and, uh, or running with, uh, with other people uh, is a way to, uh, for physical exercise to become fun so that people will do it. Or have a partner that will say, OK, uh, I'm going to meet you at 6 o'clock in the morning and we're going to walk around the shopping center or something of, of, that, uh, of that, that type. OK, uh, let's look for specifically uh, at the diverse risk factors. Uh, and then I will present to you ways that we have uh, tried to tackle the problem through use of the community. Uh, hypertension, as uh, all of you know, uh, is a uh, national problem, as I indicated. Uh, it's the most common risk factor that we have. Uh, and the, although the uh, uh, rates of hypertension uh, have it, uh, increased, the, uh, the control of blood pressure has not increased. Uh, still, half of the people that have hypertension are not being controlled. Many years ago, we said that of the people that had hypertension, Half did not know it. Of those that knew it, half were being treated. And of those that were being treated, half were being controlled. I hate to tell you that even now, half of the hypertensives that are out there that we know about are not being controlled. Uh, and, and there really is no excuse for that. Uh, in the U United States, uh, we asked uh, uh, people when did they last had their blood pressure uh, checked. And in the uh, uh, southern part uh, of, the, of the country, uh, uh, there was uh, uh, many more people that had not had their blood pressure checked uh, within the past year. So there is a south and a southeastern distribution of, uh, of just even knowing if you have a high blood pressure. Now, I told you that strokes are, are intimately tied up uh, with high blood pressure. And I cannot overemphasize the importance of controlling blood pressure in preventing strokes. Uh, almost uh, uh, 90 uh, per 100,000 uh, people in 1950, and it's more now, uh, ha uh, have had sh uh, stroke. In 1995, uh, there had been a decline uh, in, uh, in heart disease uh, and a decline in the stroke uh, rate. But the number of people that still have uncontrolled blood pressure and therefore will have at a, be at the risk of having a stroke has gone up in spite of, of, of the decline. I'll skip some of these. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, coronary heart disease is the number one uh, cause of death. Uh, and uh, uh, hypertension, uh, dyslipidemia, diabetes, and the other risk factor I mentioned to you earlier are responsible uh, for coronary disease. 
The point I want to make is that the risk factors for coronary disease, the number one cause of death, are controllable. So coronary disease is one of the most controllable or preventable problems that we have, and yet it's the number one cause of death. Uh, so it's kind of ironic that the problem that's killing more people is largely preventable by controlling uh, the risk factors. Now, one of the issues that we see in the black community is heart failure. Heart failure uh, in blacks is almost solely caused by high blood pressure. So it's the uncontrolled blood pressure that leads to heart failure. Heart failure is more malignant than most cancers. Uh, uh, the mortality is 100% uh, eventually. Uh, coronary disease is the most common cause for heart failure in whites, but in blacks it's high blood pressure. And that's why the programs that you're doing here and the ones that we're talking about today concentrate on high blood pressure in the community because in the black community it's the number one uh, cause of, of, of the problem uh, and the things that are causing death uh, and causing a lot of money uh, is related to uh, the blood pressure uh, problem. Okay, uh, hypertension in African America, I spent my last uh, 30 or so years in my research and in my practice studying hypertension in blacks. We're not as sure exactly why uh, the problem uh, exists the way it does, but it comes on earlier in blacks than whites, about seven to eight years earlier. It tends to, be, to pursue a much more malignant course in blacks and whites. Uh, it tends to uh, lead to an earlier mortality, uh, about seven to eight years earlier mortality uh, in blacks uh, compared to, to whites. Uh, and therefore, uh, we have concentrated on programs, uh, which I will show you one of them in a few minutes, uh, that have concentrated on trying to uh, address the problem of hypertension in the, uh, in the black community. Now, the, I don't want to, uh, to de-emphasize or underestimate that the cholesterol problem, the diabetes problem, the obesity problem is also in the black community, uh, but hypertension is out of proportion to anything else. So uh, what we decided several years ago is that in order to get hold of the hypertension problem in blacks, we had to do it from the community perspective. In other words, if you relied upon the usual way that patients come to doctors, uh, you're gonna miss the boat with high blood pressure. Because number one, it's a disease that for the most part is asymptomatic. So the patients are not gonna come to the doctor because they are sick or they have a headache or they are dizzy and so forth. For the most part, you're gonna have to go to the patient. Uh, the, other problem with high blood pressure is that the, uh, the treatment uh, in years past uh, has been somewhat problematic and uh, uh, the sexual dysfunction and the side effect from the drugs have been a problem. So we've had to come up with novel ways of handling the problem in the black community. Uh, so I will share with you uh, a way we, that we have done that. So uh, Josh, if you can change to, to the next uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, Jean Charleston and Anna Glenn uh, were two, uh, one the nurse and another is a, uh, uh, a sort of secretary. Uh, we formed several years ago uh, what we call the Church High Blood Pressure Program, or CHAMP program. Uh, what we did in Baltimore, we uh, uh, picked out 100 churches in the black community. I described in detail this morning uh, how we uh, went to the ministers 
uh, in the black community because of the significance of the church uh, in the black community, uh, for the most part, uh, black people do uh, go to, uh, to the church. And if you want to get something done uh, from a community perspective, uh, to get the encouragement and the support of the church is, is very, very uh, uh, important. So we formed the CHAMP, or Church High Blood Pressure Program, in which we got 100 churches uh, in the black community to agree to let us come in and, and train the trainers. Uh, uh, meant that uh, the minister, once he, uh, he or she bought into the program, uh, we uh, uh, contacted the, the leading health people at that church to have them to recruit among the church members people that were just ordinary, everyday people, many of whom had high blood pressure, to be trained in high blood pressure in the physiology, the epidemiology, uh, the pathology, the drug treatment, and so forth. And then we would have those people to, uh, throughout the church, uh, to begin to train other people such that uh, the church would be very much aware of the blood pressure problem within that uh, congregation. Now, uh, we were very successful in that uh, the churches that uh, adopted this program became permanent blood pressure, uh, not only diagnostic, but monitoring sites. Uh, once the patient uh, or the client was diagnosed as having elevated blood pressure, uh, we would follow the rules of the American Heart Association. If the blood pressure was found at the church to be at a certain level, they were sent to the emergency room. At another level, they were told to see their doctor within a week or two. At another level, they were told to come back to us at the church for a recheck. So depending upon the level of the blood pressure, we determine what we would tell the people at the church uh, in terms of, of, of follow-up. Now, we also, besides being involved in the diagnosis of hypertension in that way, we also would monitor people who knew they had high blood pressure for their doctor but we insist that they have a primary doctor who was responsible for their blood pressure care. And if they uh, came back to the church more than three times after being told to see their doctor and they didn't see their doctor, then we said we can no longer see you. We're not gonna substitute for your primary care doctor. Uh, you need to have a primary care doctor taking care of your blood pressure. Uh, we may detect it, we may uh, even diagnose it, uh, but the confirmation and the full workup and the treatment must be done by your uh, physician. So as a result of that, uh, even the beyond the 100 churches that we started with, it spread around the city of Baltimore and around the state of Maryland, and of course now it's all over the country. Uh, it's rare to go into a, a fairly large black church now and not to find a church blood pressure program. Now, that model has been extended to uh, diabetes screening, uh, to some cases to cholesterol screening, some cases to obesity counseling, and so forth. So it has been a very effective program. But Dr. Kong, uh, Wayne Kong, who was my uh, research associate for many years in Baltimore, said to me, he said, Dr. Saunders, we're not getting to the men. Uh, the men don't go to church to the same extent as the women. Uh, they go to their social club in the black community, which is the barbershop. Uh, so in the black community, the barbershop is often known as the black man's social club. I always say that if you go to the barbershop, you'll find out what's going on in the community, things that you maybe shouldn't know about, you're gonna find out about. You gotta be sure that you know that half of what you learned at the barbershop is not true. The other half is true, but you don't know what's true and what's not true. So you have to hear it all at the barbershop. Uh, but it is a place where uh, uh, um, men do hang out and often spend time there. So Dr. Kong said to me that why don't we start a similar program uh, in barbershops that we did in the churches. So I got with the uh, 
the church nurses, uh, Jean Charleston and Miss Glenn, and we started uh, what we call the Hair, Heart, and Health, a community initiative. We got funding from Blue Cross and Blue Shield uh, to start this program. Uh, okay, what is Hair, uh, Heart, and Health program? It's an innovative program designed to help reduce death and disability from cardiovascular disease by involving barbers and hairstylists in the African-American community of Baltimore City. 18 selected uh, salons offered a comprehensive blood pressure screening, referral, monitoring, and health promotion program. Well, why barbers? Well, the barber is the only person whose conversation you can follow even though he talks over your head. And uh, this is a picture of a barbershop, and this is fairly typical. They're talking and they're listening, they're laughing, they're having fun, they're talking sports and so forth. At the same time, they're reading the paper and they get in their hair done as well. So if we can say, why don't you take uh, blood pressure? Why don't you uh, tell these men that have a high rate of hypertension in the black community uh, that uh, uh, there's a silent killer out there called high blood pressure and I can detect it by simply putting a cuff around your arm and in a few minutes I can tell you what is your risk of having a stroke, a heart attack, heart failure, kidney failure, and maybe de uh, death. Uh, so uh, let's, uh, let's do it from the barber shop. Well, uh, why have barbers and hairstylists involved in health care? Hair, it seems, has been a very important social and religious issue throughout all of the history of mankind. In the book of Ezekiel, uh, it says, And thou, son of man, take thee a sharp knife, take thee a barber's razor, and cause it to pass upon thine head and upon thine beard. So uh, it goes back to biblical times uh, that uh, barbers were uh, involved in, uh, in, in people. Uh, the early barbers uh, were surgeons and dentists. You might not have known that. Uh, most early physicians uh, didn't like surgery. And therefore, as, a way, as well as hair cutting, uh, hairdressing, and shaving, barbers performed surgery of wounds. So barbers became surgeons to some extent. They would take moles off people's face and off their scalp. Uh, they even uh, would uh, uh, draw blood from people. Uh, uh, give enemas, extract teeth, uh, and they were called barber surgeons. Uh, that pole that you see, that red uh, and white uh, pole that you see spinning around, represent the stick patients would grab while being phlebotomized. The white stripe represent the bandages and the red stripes the blood. So now you know what that uh, uh, red and white striper on barber uh, shops uh, is all about. So how uh, did the program work in Baltimore? Well, uh, the operators from selected barber shops, uh, we trained them, trained them well. Tra for eight weeks, they came to uh, either to my university or to one of the churches or wherever we, uh, uh, we, we felt we could do training. And we showed slides and videos, we practiced, and uh, they actually learned the physiology of uh, the cardiovascular system. So these barbers, uh, they, uh, they knew that high blood pressure was not high tension. We taught them that having hypertension is not being high stress and being over emotional. Uh, uh, we told them that some of the calmest people in the world can have some of the worst blood pressures. So we told them what blood pressure was not and what it was. We also told them how blood pressure was related to the heart. So we had slides and movies uh, showing them the blood flowing from the heart into the vascular system. We showed them how when the pressure was high that the heart had to pump harder and the heart got larger and larger and eventually the heart failed. Uh, we had all of this on slides and, and videos so we taught them what blood pressure really was. It's amazing, a lot of people don't know what high blood pressure really is. Uh, so we, we had to teach them that. 
We also uh, taught them how we treat blood pressure. Again, it was an eight-week course. They, they went to, uh, uh, for eight weeks uh, for two hours uh, uh, a week for, for eight weeks. Uh, uh, we, uh, we told them about the drugs. We told them about the diet. We told them why salt was bad for high blood pressure. We told them why that black people were more salt sensitive than whites. We explained to them that it didn't say, we didn't prove that black people eat more salt than whites, although I think they do between me and you. <laughs> but uh, but we, we, we told them that the harm from salt is gonna be much more significant in blacks than in whites. That's called salt sensitivity. We explained that to them. So we explained to them that's why uh, black people have to be much more careful about not only uh, uh, picking foods that are low in sodium, but cooking foods with salt and obviously adding salt from the table. Uh, we told them that uh, most of the salt that we consume is not consumed from the table, but is consumed from food that's processed already. So we went through a very comprehensive uh, type of uh, education on, uh, on blood pressure, on the problem in blacks and why blacks, as far as we knew, had it more. And we went through the drugs. Uh, we told them that yes, uh, the older drugs did cause uh, sexual dysfunction. Uh, uh, but we told them that we had new drugs now that the calcium blockers, the ACE inhibitors, low-dose diuretics, the ARBs, the alpha blockers, did not cause sexual dysfunction like the beta blockers and high doses of diuretics. I said to the group this morning that uh, one of my uh, patients told me years ago when I told him about uh, uh, why I wanted to put him on drugs for high blood pressure, and he was concerned about a sexual function, and I, uh, but before I told him that we had new drugs, he said, doctor, I'd rather go down with a smile on my face. Uh, so he said, I, I'll accept the side effects. Uh, I, I, I will not accept the side effects as long as I can have good sex. Uh, uh, but I, I convinced him that uh, we had drugs that did not uh, cause sexual dysfunction for the most part. Okay, so uh, after the training, we gave him an examination. And after the examination, we gave him a certificate. Again, we had funding from Blue Cross and Blue Shield so we could afford to do this. We gave them a certificate and we gave them smocks that they could wear in their shop saying that they had been trained by the University of Maryland High Blood Pressure uh, Program. So they felt very proud of the fact that they had gone through formal training. Uh, so the, the, the shops were then designated uh, as a hair, heart, and health center or a 3H center. The certified stylists and barbers and community health advocates uh, educated their clients about the myths and misconceptions. So after we trained the barbers, then they trained or they educated their clients. Besides taking the blood pressure, they would tell the clients while they're cutting their hair about high blood pressure. Uh, uh, so the, the increased awareness of the, of the problem was told. Uh, and of course, the shops also uh, provided uh, ongoing monitoring and work with the uh, community physicians. Uh, we wanted to be sure, like in the churches, that the clients would not substitute uh, going to the barber shop and getting blood pressure uh, education and, and measurement for going to their primary care physician. Uh, so, uh, how do we, do we maintain the program? Well, uh, I, I told you about the, uh, the training. Uh, we also gave some CPR training as a, a sort of bonus. Uh, we gave blood pressure equipment to the shops. We, again, we had funding to do this. Uh, we, uh, we, we, we gave a TV to each barber shop where they could show movies uh, of, the, uh, uh, of, of the blood pressure story as well as, it was a regular TV, so they, they had a TV otherwise. Uh, some of them got DVD players and so forth. Uh, we had different videos that uh, they could show throughout uh, the day. Uh, and they were compensated. Uh, we gave them $3 for every blood pressure that they took and they sent us a record of. Uh, 
Again, with the funding, we could afford to do that. So there was an incentive. Uh, but also, remember, these barbers are in business. So they, they got to cover their costs. So they got $3 for every blood pressure that they uh, measured and sent us a report uh, to the Heart Association. Uh, and uh, we went on television, uh, and many of the barber shops uh, uh, were featured on many of the TV news uh, programs. Uh, so they got good publicity, and so they end up getting a little extra uh, benefit from it. Uh, what else did, uh, did we give to the clients that uh, came to the barber shop? They got newsletters, they got invitations to special events, they got uh, opportunity to earn special uh, free gifts, uh, they got free blood pressure uh, monitoring uh, kits, uh, and they got uh, free weight loss counseling. Not that they followed it, but they got the counseling anyway. <laughs> um, uh, we even uh, gave a point system uh, to make it kind of fun. Uh, if they did the screening, they got so many points. If they, uh, a reduction in risk factor, they got so many points. If they saw their physician, they got so many points. Uh, and, uh, uh, and if they participated in our health freedom walk, they got so many points. Uh, and uh, after you accumulated points, they got gifts. So uh, it was a very successful uh, type program. Again, uh, it took some money uh, to do that. Uh, so uh, we uh, compensated them at the rate that you see there. Uh, 30 or more barbers got as much as $60 uh, per month. Okay, so uh, currently, and we're talking a few years back now, uh, the Hair Hard and Health uh, program has successfully recruited 18 barber shops and beauty sal salons, uh, and 15 at the time, this was two years ago, were still active. We screened a cumulative total of 3,075 new first time participants. Uh, we referred 682 people to a health care provider, and we provided blood pressure monitoring for approximately. 828 known hypertensive patients. Uh, the demographics of the participants, as you can see in the black community, this is true. Uh, they're young people, people in the prime of life. Uh, this is when people should be going about doing good things in life, uh, but many of them will be struck down with high blood pressure or with its consequences. So we feel very good about the fact that uh, the barbershop program, as opposed to the church program, which tend to get more older people, the barbershop program got younger people, and of course we got more uh, males. Uh, we did a, uh, a, uh, a survey uh, and we found that 49% of the people that we screened of those uh, almost 4,000 uh, had a free hypertension. This is the black community. 12% uh, had stage one or two hypertension. Uh, 4,000 people, that's a lot of people. 80% uh, reported having at least one cardiovascular risk factor. Our current data uh, two years ago reflects an average of 17, 17 millimeter of mercury decrease in systolic blood pressure and 10 millimeter decrease in diastolic blood pressure for participants' initial screening in stage one or stage two. Uh, so we did have a follow-up. Uh, unfortunately, when the funding ran out, we were unable to continue the program. Uh, so that's the uh, program that we started. I'm very happy to say that I visit other cities like in New York and I found uh, programs in Harlem and Chicago. Uh, some places have made the program very fancy. Uh, they have added many things to it. Uh, and, uh, and I'm very happy, I was glad to find out here that you are actually beginning to train people at the level of barber schools, uh, which we were not doing, which I think is absolutely wonderful. Uh, thank you very much. We'll be very glad to entertain some questions or discussion. Thank you. <coughs> Any questions for, for Dr. Saunders? Where did you get your funding to initially start this program? Yeah. We got our initial funding from Blue Cross and Blue Shield, uh, and of course that funding was limited. 
uh, we, uh, some of the barbers continue to program even after the funding ran. There's still programs in Baltimore that are ongoing, that uh, the barbers like the program. They feel that it is added to the prestige of their barbershop. Uh, uh, they, now, uh, the health department also decided later on in another part of town to fund 15 barbershops. So, uh, so the, after Blue Cross Blue Shield funding ran out, the health department picked up some of the funding uh, for a selected number of barbershops. But some of the shops are going on their own. We talked to a number of the barbers today, and as Dr. Saunders said, we started with the, the, the barber shop that trains the barbers. And um, at this point in time, uh, unless it got more complicated than what we're doing, the awareness, um, they felt they could continue to do it without being compensated. But if they got involved in the studies, or if we had to go through uh, consent and all those other issues, that's a different story. So at this point in time, they, they were uh, pretty excited about continuing the program uh, of education and awareness. But if it got more complicated, we got involved in studies, that's what they would talk about potentially being um, reimbursed. Now, just this morning, uh, Dr. Levine sent me a note from the medical director of Blue Cross Blue Shield, just out of the blue, as, as you were talking this morning to the pastors and to the, uh, to the barbers about some issues that Blue Cross Blue Shield wants to get more involved in, in primary care issues, and this might be a perfect project for them to start to fund. Yes, Terry. So I sent you an email when you were talking that says, uh, to ask you, so I'll ask you, how long was the funding and how much was it since we got an email? So our chancellor got the email from Blue Cross today asking for what we need. Uh, we were funded for two years. What was the total? How much you get? Uh, I don't recall the, the, the amount of money we got. Uh, I tend to stay out of the financial part of it. <laughs> <laughs> You had mentioned that you had a lower decrease um, percentage in stage one and two. Right. What, were y'all able to identify which risk, risk factor that would contribute to that the most? Like as far as like the um, weight loss education or I mean, what was your, out of the risk factors that you listed, what was the main contributor to that lower percentage? Were y'all able to identify that? Yeah, the people were going to their doctors now uh, they were they, they, uh, pe people that probably were not going to doctors before were now going to their doctors and being treated. So it's a medication. Yeah, it, oh medication. Oh yeah, this is not non pharma This is a medication treatment by being referred to their primary care provider. Yes. You know, one thing Dr. Saunders mentioned today is just the term hypertension is something that he doesn't even like. He just told the story about the, the, the patients who say, my husband's not tense to me. So he prefers just high blood pressure because when they use the word tension in, in, in the African-American community, he's been asked, well, my husband is a very calm man. He doesn't ever get excited. Why would he ever have high blood pressure? I mean, so even the word hypertension is sometimes misleading. Is that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. So I, I'd rather say high blood pressure and explain to the person that it actually is an increase in force in your body against your heart and against your blood vessels. And it's, and it's pushing uh, uh, blood against your blood vessel and heart in a way that's not good. Well, Dr. Saunders, thank you so much. We're, I know we, uh, that was, uh, Pastors here uh, came up to me, a number of them, after your talk this morning in the community. And obviously we have a, I think we have over 300 years of ministry th this morning downstairs in the Zadok Conference Room. And uh, they're excited about starting something at their churches, as well as uh, we had uh, some of the most famous barbers, uh, legendary barbers here in, in, uh, in Shreveport, Louisiana. And I will tell you, one of the side effects, positive benefits of of this program that we've begun. And I have to tell you, several of the barbers who are in their 70s came up to me, and, and I've got to tell you, they said, we didn't know that you had any African-American medical students at LSU. And could my grandson, my granddaughter, 
uh, maybe think about a health career someday. It was amazing to me that they didn't know of uh, the health professions uh, of allied health, occupational therapy, speech therapy, physician assistants, all the occupations we have, and that um, uh, we educated them on the fact that diversity is also a, a major issue here at LSU and we want to increase diversity. That was amazing to me, and I think they've talked to Joshua about that. So we've also educated them that their children, grandchildren, relatives now can think about a, a career in healthcare where in the, in the past they may not have thought that way. So with that, Dr. Sorg, we're going to give you a little time off. You know, he's been traveling. Thank you again for coming to Shreveport and, and sharing the amazing things you've done. Thank you. You're welcome.